Hey, welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio. I am your host, Professor Paul Markle. And we are at the Glass Case of Motion Studios today, as per usual, at Student of the Gun University. Student of the Gun University has mobile training courses and they have in-house training courses. We've got the Beyond the Band-Aid class uh, coming up. Up north, up north in Michigan, we have a Beyond the Band-Aid class. You guys, all of you northerners and midwesterners and people uh, that are above the Mason-Dixon line have been whining that you don't want to drive all the way down to Biloxi. Okay, I'm calling you out. You don't want to drive all the way down to Biloxi? Fine. Go to Michigan. You know what? No excuses. No excuses. We're coming to you, so you should come to us. Something, when we come to you. Something like that. It's it called makes perfect sense. It's called an adventure. Take it. Seats are filling up, so SOTGU.com, make sure you get your seat. Uh, it's a limited space class. Yes, it is a limited space class, so uh, get while the getting is good. You will not regret it. Uh, read the reviews. You're like, well, I'm not really sure. You know, Is this something that's going to benefit me? I don't know. The reviews are on the normal class that is hosted down here in Biloxi. So you it's can the same go. class, it's just in a different Yeah, place. I know, but I, the, I had to create a new product for the mobile class. Uh, so the reviews are not on there. However, you can read the reviews on SOTGU.com. Yes, you can. And speaking of products, we're bringing back a an oldie. Jorts. But, bringing back shorts? Jorts. Jorts. I don't know what that is. Jean shorts? Je- no, no, we're not bringing back oh. jean shorts. And that they were never called jorts. Okay, maybe your weird hippie, like metrosexual generation calls them that, but I when I grew I up with jean up. shorts, they were shorts. J for jean, orts no. for shorts. No, no. Get back, get back with me. Come back around. Come back around to the student of the gun here. Okay, we're going to tell the kids uh, at home that uh, we're going to be bringing back a uh, something that was on the old original student of the gun store but it hasn't been there since we opened the new store since you spruced up and and uh yeah if you guys like the store you should and the, the store now the online store looks way better than it did but that's what happens when you evolve right and what is that thing go ahead and tell them what that thing is that new that thing that was gone and now it's back oh again. it's a it's a product yeah, but what kind of a product is it? Uh, the kind that you buy? No, okay. It's a DVD, the Arm Living DVD. We've actually only got a limited number of physical copies. Once those are gone, we're not doing the physical copies anymore. We will be doing digital after that. Uh, so it's a physical copy of the DVD and a physical copy of the Student of the Gun book. That's right. It's a combo package. You're going to save some money. And we know that some of you guys out there, uh, you like to actually hold the product the physical product in your hand okay we got you uh this was a this was a combo deal that was like i said it was on the original student of the gun store and then when jared upgraded updated the the store is the way it is it kind of went away so somebody said hey how come you don't have that anymore and we're like well you know what that is a good question why don't we have that anymore so it, uh, if you haven't been to sotgu.com uh, lately or student of the gun uh take a moment stop on in I was just sitting over here thinking, who still has disk drives? And, but I have three computers with disk, disk drives sitting right in front of me. The so. one that's in front of me does. But. Yeah, hey, go. GunDistrict.com. I'm on GunDistrict right now. And I'm going to answer a question. I'm going to answer a question from GunDistrict. And it says, question for SOTG guys. When purchasing OC spray, is a fogger or a stream spray a better option? Uh, and how many ounces should you carry? I recommend carrying 12 to 16 ounces at all times on my on yourself. No, I kid. <laughs> you know how much damage you could do with 16 ounces of pepper spray? A lot. You could have a party. Uh, fog or stream? You know, it's a good question. And many, many years ago, they had like a solid stream that looked like a little squirt, like, like a solid pea stream coming out of the can and you have to aim that you specifically have to like you know aim it at the face whereas a fogger you just spray it out and there's this big fog of you know oc and they have to run through it most of the manufacturers figured out that a solid stream was the was probably the least effective that goes all the way back to the old mace days back in the 70s and 80s uh, so what you're going to find the majority of is you're going to find what they call a splatter stream. When it comes out, it kind of like spritzes out 
Uh, but do be aware of the fact that uh, if it is a quote unquote stream model, you are going to have to aim it. Uh, when it comes to like crosswind, obviously a stream is more effective in a crosswind than a fog is. But really, you're, you're kind of splitting atoms because you're using this. You're not using it at, at 10, 20, 50 feet. You're using it at like three to four feet. You know, four to six feet is the optimum distance to use pepper spray. Uh, so uh, fog or stream is kind of, you know, you like Coke or Pepsi. Uh, either one will get you by. Uh, as far as ounces, I would I would stay away from anything that is less than one a lot of these little crappy keychain models are like one half ounce. I'm like, really? It's the best you could come up with was one half ounce. Uh, and the, we've talked about the crappy keychain models before. Don't waste your money on those; they're junk. Uh, one, one and a half, two ounces, three ounces is actually kind of a big can. A three ounce can is kind of big. Uh, and it's probably something you're not going to carry on you because it's large. Is it large? Yeah, I'm gonna reach. I'm reaching into my pocket right now. I don't know if you if you heard the Velcro. I'm gonna guess two ounces, two and a half, three. Um, wait, no, no. This is this the uh, this is the the one I have in my pocket right now that I just pulled out is called the First Defense Mark Six from Safari Land. So you know it's got to be good. It is a uh, stream model, and it is three quarters of an ounce. But it's the perfect size to keep in a pocket to keep on you. Yeah. It has a little safety cap so you it, don't accidentally push down. Yeah, say it's three quarters of an ounce in an actual container that's yeah. meant for pepper spray. Not not an eyeglass cleaner or... You want, you want to know what... I, I, I had to spray pepper spray at an animal. You did? Last on uh, Sunday. Oh, really? What, yeah. Was it a cat? Uh, no, it was a dog. A dog? Okay. Yeah. And then so I did that, did my thing, put my gloves back on, and Alex and I were doing the... Um, planting flowers in the garden at the house and about i don't know 20 minutes later or something uh you I rubbed your eyes off and i rubbed my eye and then i was like oh derp so then i got really mad at that dog derp derp and i wanted to go kick it <laughs> like a little football uh oh one, one other question i'm going to answer this one and then we'll move on this is also coming to us from gundistrict.com uh question about the tp9 SA. Uh, versus the V2, uh, what's, the, what's the benefits of one over the other? Uh, let me tell you what, the, the V2, I believe they essentially has the, the same trigger configuration as the original TP9 did, which was the same configuration as the SW99, which was the same as the P99, which essentially is a, a light double action and then a single action. So the, the, the TP9 SA is essentially like a Glock trigger. Actually, it's like a really good Glock trigger, a well-broken-in Glock trigger, not a crappy New York one. Uh, and then the V2, people complain. They're like, oh, I don't like the two trigger presses. But the, the, the V2, it's not like your old Smith & Wesson, you know, three-digit double action to single action where you had, or, or a God in heaven, a military-issue Beretta where the double action pull is 15 and a half pounds and the single action is five. Oh. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't so much uh, sweat that. Now, I, I will admit that we don't have a V2 in our hot little hands. I've got an original TP9, uh, which we shot a whole bunch, and when we had no problems with that, we shot probably what, somewhere in the neighborhood of 700 to 1,000 rounds out of that. And then we've got the the essays that we've been shooting, and Jared and I both have uh, several hundred rounds through each one of our guns right now with with no problems. If you're if you don't mind. Here, here, let me tell you what. Can I tell you a little story about the about how stupid gun people are or gun culture people are? Sure. All right. You don't have to tell me because I already know. Yeah. But All right. The TP9SA. Anyway. The TP9SA, when I got it out of the box and I started fiddle-farting around with it, I realized that it had that the decocker on the top of it. Now, the decocker thing is left over from the original trigger configuration where if the gun was in, quote, single action mode you you take two fingers press down on top uh or a or a, a strong thumb and press down on top of that and it decocks it and it puts it back into the quote double action trigger mode well with the SA if you push down on that it basically it decocks the firing pin and it base it takes the gun out of battery it cannot be fired until you rack the slide again 
And when I first saw that, I was like, mm, why did they leave that there? Well, I know I realized why they left it there, because otherwise they would have had to completely re-engineer and redesign the slide. And from a manufacturer's standpoint, they're like, how much is it going to cost to do that? And how much are we selling these guns for? If they were selling the guns for $800, um, I can see putting in the, the time to, to remanufacture the slide. But when you're selling a gun for 350 bucks, a full-size, duty size. Nine millimeter pistol for three hundred and fifty bucks. You don't put in fifty grand in a slide remanufacture. You got it. It's basic economics. Well, then when I met with Jared and I, uh, we met with Jacob, uh, Jacob Herman, who is the marketing dude from Century Arms, and he said, "Let me show you something. This is what our guys are doing." And he, he did the whole to disassemble because if you have a striker fired gun, whether it's a Glock, a Smith and Wesson, it doesn't matter what it is. If the striker is in the cocked or semi-cocked or mostly cocked position, in order to disassemble the gun, you have to relieve the spring tension on the striker. That's just the way it is. Well, with the uh, the TP9SA, you remove the magazine, you clear the you, know, you clear the chamber, you reach up, you push down on the decocker, it takes the spring tension off, and then you disassemble the gun. And you don't unlike because I know there are people out there who say I don't give a crap whether you have to pull the Glock trigger or not. I'm I'm safe with my guns and I know what I'm doing. You and I both, brother. You and I both. But you also know that there are gun culture people that are still twenty, thirty years into the Glock pistol are still saying things like I never own a gun that you had to pull the trigger to disassemble. There, those people are still out there. So. For the SA, they're like, all right, smarty, if this really bunges you up, watch. Click, tr- disassembled, never have to touch the trigger. Ooh, ah. Well, so they do that, and then what does the gun culture come around and do? They complain about that. They're like, what if you're rolling around and you're in a in a, in a fight with somebody and you, you fall on the ground and, and your gun gets decocked? Then it's a dead gun. Oh, now what are you going to do? Uh, you rack the slide and keep shooting. What, what do you do if your slide goes out of battery? What do you do if you have a stovepipe? What if you do, what do you do if you have a failure to fa- a type one or a type two stoppage? How do you make it work again? You tap the magazine, rack the slide, or you rack it on your belt, or you do whatever. You know, if God hates you so much that, that you're wrestling around with somebody and your and your TP9 gets uncocked, just freaking. There's this thing called immediate action to get your guns back up and running. I know this is a a weird concept to some people in the audience called immediate action. You don't have to stare at the gun. You don't have to put on your x-ray specs and, and like, check out the internal workings to wonder whether or not there's a round in the chamber. Uh, You just tap the magazine and rack the slide. Uncocked. That sounds like a a TV show. So, yeah. (laughs) Anyway, so there are some some, uh, some gun culture... uh, equipment managers who made youtube videos about how that's a flaw in the gun and it makes it unsafe and i would never own or carry that gun because blah blah, blah. I was like just shut up please so says he who has never carried especially that gun who has never done any practical use with that specific gun oh the the, Not you. the, the yeah. equipment manager yeah the equipment. yeah um and I'm not giving him a free plug on my You were show. looking at me, you're like, what are you saying right now? <laughs> no. I'll come through that glass. No, no, no. Uh, anyway, so what Century did is they're like, okay, crybabies. Okay, gun culture crybabies. Here's what we're going to do. That's, that's bunging you up. We'll just put the original trigger back in it. Uh, we're never happy. I swear. You we're can't nev- make everybody happy. We're, we're, they're never happy. Now, I, I do believe that they have in the works that they have a compact version in the works. A TP9 that's that is about the size. Was, SF? Yeah. That's probably that is going to be. Um, super freaky. Super freaky now. Uh, we need to get a hold of Jacob and, and confirm that. But I believe, because last time we were talking, he said they were developing one that was going to be uh, about the size of a, a Glock 19. Because everyone now, they're like, well, yeah, I like the gun and everything, and it, it works, and, you know, blah, blah, but it's too big to carry. <sighs> it's $350, and, and if you go online, they have a $25 off, like, rebate going on now. So let's just say that you paid 350 
you get your $25 rebate, you're down to $325. Do you spoiled gun culture babies realize how good you have it? You, they don't. They, they don't. They're, the gun culture today is a bunch of spoiled babies. I'm not trying to go off, but they are. Dude, I, I was, I've was i been in this world, this gun culture world, for 30-plus years. And I remember when your choice of duty handgun was in the single digits. You know, you either carried a 1911, or you carried a high power of some sort, or you carried either a Smith & Wesson primarily, or maybe a Colt double-action revolver. And that was pretty much it. That and that was it. When I when I was in the Marine Corps, you know, we transitioned over to the Beretta. That was a huge deal because there was this new gun on on the scene. Uh, I remember when gun uh, firearms instructors, you know, Matt, gun industry people would tell you only shoot hardball or round nose ammunition through semi autos because they can't reliably cycle jacketed hollow point ammunition, and that was true thirty years ago. It is not true today. Not even close. So we are, as a gun culture, there's so much stuff that is available to you right now that we become a bunch of spoiled babies. Like, I want everything I want, and I want it exactly how I want it, and I want you to come to my house and hand it to me. Did I tell you that Gun District has officially joined Team Markle? What? Yeah, they're, they are supporting me as an official sponsor for uh, my fight on August 22nd. Oh, well, there you go. I thought you were saying they were, like, officially on board with, like, us as a group. Yeah, Team Markle. <laughs> no, that's the uh, the WFC promotion. When they posted my fight matchup picture, they hashtagged it Team Markle and Team Henry Aww. for the opponent. Oh, so that's guess for that's Widow Hearts. People are using now. Is that – they're using hashtags, huh? Is that a hashtag fact? Um, I'm going to go. <laughs> you're not, not going to comment on that? Whether or not that, whether or not that is a hashtag fact? I'm going to go uh, hang myself in the gym now. Because <laughs> I have a rope. Uh, don't do that. Don't do that. All right, hippies. Uh, enough questions from the, uh, what you call it here? Enough questions from Gun District. Let's go ahead and jump into the notes. You got the uh, the filter music all queued up? Um, I can. Go ahead oh, and speaking of Speaking of I music. Got, we're going to start out with good news. Speaking of music, uh, the obviously Madison Rising supports Student of the Gun Radio. And they, they let us use their music. Um, it's a mutual beneficiary thing for us. Mm-hmm. So they let us use their music to open and close. So if you guys like that opening music, and if you don't, then go listen to something else during the yeah. opening. But if you like it, go to madisonrising.com and you can check them out there. They've got a bunch you of cool can, stuff. You can. You're allowed. We will let you. We will allow you to check them out. That's why I say amen, I shot. A good shot. Man, this is a good shot, man. And I tell you what, uh, I li- I'm so happy to be able to open up this uh, the show with some good news. And we got this story uh, two days ago as you're hearing it. We put it up on our social media. Everyone's like, yeah, rock on. All right, the story is from freebeacon.com. And since it's been up, it's been uh, resourced and, and it's all over the place. But good, good news. Now, don't expect CNN to give these guys kudos because they're they're more worried about the uh, covering the, the, the unarmed black teen who was shot by a white officer, Darren Wilson. They're, they're all focused on that right now, throwing gasoline on that fire. But this story's by Stephen Gutowski. SAS sniper kills ISIS, or IS. For whatever reason, they just use capital I, capital S, uh, executioner, before you can behead an eight-year-old boy. Because they're, they're the Islamic state, state. They're, but they're, they're not only they're not in Muslim. Iraq and Syria. Yeah, they're not, they're not so. Muslim. I, I, yeah, remember the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria are not Muslim, and they don't represent the the religion of peace and brotherhood. So keep that in mind. A British sniper from the elite SAS, as opposed to non-elite. Somebody pointed that out. They're like, did they really have to put elite SAS? Because if Isn't you that- are in the SAS, yeah, that's pretty much. Uh, elite SAS saved an eight-year-old boy and his father from an Islamic State executioner by shooting the executioner in the head last month. 
we could just drop Mike and walk off stage right there. But the SAS sniper team was reportedly tipped off by, uh, to the execution in the Syrian desert by an Iraqi spy. That would be an informant. Uh, when they arrived, they found several Shia Muslims had already been beheaded by their captors. The ISIS, uh, IS, commonly referred to as ISIS, uh, executioner flanked on both sides by armed companions was preparing to kill a young boy and his father when the SAS team deployed its, check this out, I'm getting a freedom boner, when it deployed its 50 caliber silenced sniper rifle. <laughs> So choice. Uh, the ISIS thug who was about to decapitate the father was shot in the head and collapsed, an unnamed source said. Uh, everyone just stared in confusion. The sniper d- dispatched the two henchmen with single shots, three kills, three bullets. Um, he should have waited until they were all lined up next to each other and, like, got three kills with one bullet. That's that's a goocher right there. <laughs> <laughs> the young boy and his father were last spotted heading to Turkish border of the Sir- uh, as the Syrian town they were evacuating celebrated the killing of the ISIS fighters. It was a good day's work, the source told the paper. And that's why we say, hey man, nice shot. <laughs> all right. Uh, now that you're happy, now that you're feeling all giddy, uh, let's go ahead and thank our friends at Century Arms, who we've already talked about in great detail. And uh, also Crossbreed Holsters at CrossbreedHolsters.com. Carry a gun, carry the cross. All right, we've got a SWAT fuel fitness talk today. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to step out of the glass case of emotion. And I'm going to allow our special guest, little Alex Blake. She's going to come, Alexandra. Uh, she's going to come in and she's going to talk about essential oils. She's got some professional fitness tips. I wanted to bring Alex on today to talk about the essential oils because I myself had a a good experience with them. Um, I've been doing mixed martial arts for a little while now, so I've had my nose broken several times, and I had scar tissue built up in my right nostril, so it was pretty much, uh, I would say, 90% blocked. Uh, Well, she started doing this essential oil stuff, and she gave me this oil called, what was it called? Frankincense. Frankincense. And that is a biblical oil, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, She gave me one of those. She said, here, put this in your nose. I want to try this out. So put on a Q-tip, stuck it up in my nose. And we did that for a few weeks. And it started, my nose actually started opening up. And now I can actually breathe out of both nostrils. So I wanted to bring her on and get her to talk about it. Maybe there's something in your life that these essential oils can help. And um, she's got a lot of information about them. So... Alex, what are essential oils? Um, So basically, essential oils are extracted nutrients from the plants. And that's pretty much it. That's a a pretty simple explanation. So uh, basically, um, I guess what they do is they they take the plants and they distill the nutrients. It Mm -hmm. comes in a liquid form and they put it in a little bottle. And it's concentrated, correct? Exactly. What happens is you grow the plants, you harvest the plants... You have to let the plants decay so that way the the aromatic liquids and mm-hmm. stuff that flow through the plants mm-hmm. um, matures and becomes potent. And then you crush the plants, and mostly it's done through steam distillation, and it comes out as water and essential oil, and they just separate them. And what you get is the essential oils and all of their therapeutic properties. So you guys are out there wondering... Why do these essential oils matter to me? I don't understand. So, Alex, why? how are these essential oils related to fitness or um, care of your body? Well, how are they not related to fitness or care of your body? They're therapeutic. <laughs> um, so, really, you can't go wrong with using essential oils in relation to your fitness because the therapeutic properties in essential oils are there to support and work with your body naturally. And they, there's an essential oil out there to support every system in your body. 
your muscle and bones, your digestion, your immune system, your nervous system, your energy levels. Um, take citrus essential oils, for example. Citrus essential oils are super, super awesome for your body just overall because many of them help support metabolism. They help support your digestive system. They help detox your body. Think about like all the times when people are like, yeah, drink hot lemon water in the morning. Well, think about how much more effective it would be if you took super, super concentrated lemon essential oil to put that in your water. So what it's, benefit does lemon water in the morning have? Um, well, lemon essential oil and lemons really, but lemon essential oil is really, really great for your body. Um, and I actually didn't know a lot of this before I started reading this book called Essentially Fit. It has a lot of great information in it. Um, if you guys want to get that, I'll put a, a link. You grad program members, I'll send an email to you with a link. But if you're not a part of the grad program, go to studentofgunradio.com. Um, click on 224. I believe that's this episode. And there will be a link in there to the Essentially Fit book. Uh, it's by Adam Ringham. Mm -hmm. And you can get it on Amazon. Uh, you don't have to go to the Student Gun Radio and click the link. But if you do, you're much more awesome than the people that don't. <laughs> but um, so lemon oil can help balance your body's pH and, you know, all of that. Your pH is basically yeah. what helps your body function normally because if you're too acidic, you know, you're not going to digest food properly and things like that. You'll melt away. <laughs> yes. Um, but it also helps increase your metabolo metabolism. It will That's important, guys. Yes. It will stimulate your lymph system, which also coincidentally helps support your immune system because your lymph and your immune system work perfectly together. Think about when you, like, have a sore throat and you can poke your neck and you have all those swollen glands in there, mm -hmm. that's your lymph system collecting all the garbage and flushing it out. Mm -hmm. So it's important to support that by the lemon oil helping to assist to flush that out. And it also fills your body with antioxidants, which helps. Those are also good things. Yes, fantastic things because they help fight off anything that is trying to attack your body in a negative way. That's cool. So essential oils, they can basically help you with your physical fitness as well as your mental fitness. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, citrus oils are also very good for energizing. Just like taking a, opening up your bottle of like lemon oil or lime oil or grapefruit oil or orange oil or anything like that. And just taking a nice whiff of it is really energizing for your body. And it's very beneficial for your nervous system. Aromatherapy, period is very beneficial for your nervous system. I'll tell you what, guys. Uh, when I got, uh, other than the frankincense story, I had another experience with uh, oils. And it's usually when I get a massage, if you guys get massages regularly, you know that if you lay face down for an ex extended period of time, your nose gets all clogged up, your sinuses get all clogged up. So uh, I just had her burn some, or diffuse, I guess, mm -hmm. not burn, yeah. diffuse some peppermint and the peppermint actually opened up my sinuses. I didn't get the stuffy effect that I usually got. Mm -hmm. So that was that was pretty interesting. Now you guys are out there like, okay, I'm, I'm down with the essential oils, but how do I use them? You know, I wanna get some, what do I do with them then? So basically there are three ways that you can use your essential oils. And this is where your research comes in handy because there are two things that you wanna look for when you choose your essential oils is one, is it 100% therapeutic grade? And two, is there an expiration date? You never want there to be an expiration date because that means you've got complete crap. Like an essential oil should never expire as long as you store it in a cool, dark place. And two, is it 100% therapeutic grade? Because if it's not 100% therapeutic grade, you could possibly get an extremely diluted, ineffective product. Because think about if you get three drops of essential oil and the rest of your 15 milliliter bottle is say olive oil you are not going to get any benefit from that as opposed to having 100 percent in that bottle only being lavender essential oil um, 
And so then this is where you want to look at what are the recommended uses for this oil. And it will either be aromatic, topical, or dietary. So that basically what you're saying is that they should make sure they're educated and how it's, it's not going to work the same for everybody. It's like I said before in a previous episode of um, Fitness Talk that athletes are built on different anvils. Well, they're forged differently. So, And that goes to say that your body is going to be different from, say, your wife's body or your son's body or your daughter's body. Your body is just – it's your body. It works for you. Exactly, exactly. And that's why there are so many different essential oils out there that support the same systems. So you can – test which ones work best for you and you can always use the most optimal oil for your body and i know you guys are out there you're like well i don't even know where to start i don't even know what questions to ask uh, that's what alex is for and yes. if you guys have any more questions uh, about this i know some of you have some wives that are into the the 100 percent natural uh, remedies and that's what this is so if they have questions, have them contact Alex, or you can contact Alex uh, if you have questions. And how do they do that? Via click language and smoke signals. <laughs> well, you guys better get to learning. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, you guys all know my email, alex at studentofthegun.com, and you can always reach me there with any questions, comments, concerns. And if you guys are interested in checking out the essential oils, I have a way for you to do that. I get all of my oils through Young Living, which is a fantastic Christian company, if that is something that you guys are all concerned about. It's not any weird new age, and it is one of the only FDA regulated, meaning that it is going to be 100% pure essential oils, they cannot put any additives or any kind of crap in it that could negatively affect your body. They are just, they're a fantastic company with great standards. And they also have convenient starter kits for you guys. So if you're interested in learning more about that, also please email me at alex at studentofthegun.com. You guys heard your marching orders. Do that. Uh, and I, I personally know that some of the stuff worked for me. I wouldn't put her on here talking about this if I didn't believe in the actual product that she's talking about. So, Alex, have you ever taken SWAT fuel? Since this is a SWAT fuel fitness um, talk. Do I work at Student of the Gun? <laughs> yes, of course I've taken SWAT fuel, and I love SWAT fuel. Do you remember your first experience with SWAT fuel? Um, oh, my gosh. I think it was when we were in Vegas at SHOT Show. I don't remember either. Yeah, I no, it was at Vegas at Shot Show, and you can, can, do you remember enough to tell them about your first experience? Yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, what happened was we were in Vegas, meaning it was in bed no later than or no earlier than two o'clock in the morning, and up at nice, bright, shiny eight o'clock. And this was I, for Shot Show. Yeah, <laughs> it was for work. Otherwise, I would not be up at eight in the morning. Um, I am not a morning person, and six hours of sleep is not enough to sustain my body. Um, so I was SWAT fueling every day, pretty much, to just help keep me up, alert, and business-minded. Yeah. And running around like a chicken with my head cut off. <laughs> and she, she didn't kill me during that trip or after we got home. So No, so it was uh, successful. Must have been okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's, if you guys want to – you guys know – that you can save money on your SWAT fuel order by going to swapfuelstore.com and using the promo code SOTG2015. Uh, obviously, if you're part of the grad program member or if you're a grad program member, go to your email and you have a special code in there that gets you a little bit more off. But uh, all of you need to go to swapfuelstore.com and use your promo code to save some money. And uh, we're going to be done for today. So thank you, Miss Alex, are. for coming on the radio and talking about your... 100% hippie oils. <laughs> 100% not hippie oils. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anybody who reads the Bible knows they're in there too. But thank you guys for having me. Well, thank you, little Alex, for hipping us to the essential oils and all that good stuff. And we're going to move on now with today's show, uh, thanking Brownells at brownells.com. Check out their new products category. Duracoat. Oh, Ron Burgundy. 
Yeah, that was awesome. Love it. If you guys are the grad program members, go to the grad program member Facebook page and check out the Ron Burgundy The Ron Burgundy code. rifle. Yeah. Very, very cool. That was cool. Uh, frog lube, it just works. It's green, it's minty, and it lubes your guns up. So do it. I think we should make frog lube. A frog lube commemorative rifle in green. Oh, with Durko. oh, dude! Did your brain just explode? Yes, mine just exploded I think too. We should do that. Oh, we, that's okay. That's the next thing. Yeah. I have to. We have to get on the the. Uh, you have to get see, the color palette. See if we can we have get, to go to the Duraco color palette. Yeah, we have to get and the we green. We have to match the exact frog lube green. Just do a mint green. Well, I, I don't know. If, I uses, don't think the frog it? lube is. I don't know. Well, yeah, we'll do that, we'll and then see if we can get uh, Larry to send us a stencil of the Frog Lube logo, the Frog Lube, the Frog Dude. Yeah, the, the frog. The frog, yeah. The, that the, would be uh, cool. The badass-looking frog. Ooh, yeah. I like that. I like that. Oh, and Velocity Triggers at VelocityTriggers.com. You know what's funny? Hmm. I'm going to tell you what's funny. Yesterday, I was perusing the gun um, the gun news websites like Ammo Land and, and Outdoor Wire and Shooting Wire and stuff like that. Uh, often, they're, they're good firearms-related news stories there. And they had, there was a press release for a new drop-in trigger company. And I was like, oh, really? All right. So I clicked on it. And uh, it basically, it looks like the the velocity trigger, only just a little bit differently. You know, they did like a skeletonized thing, and they used some different colors. And I thought, yeah, but it's essentially the same thing as a velocity trigger. So I'll pop over to their website, and I'll click on the product code, and I'll see how much it is. Dude, it was $100 more than a velocity trigger. Wow. I about choked. Yeah. For essentially, go to Velocity Triggers. They have different trigger weights and different trigger designs, but they're all priced, you know, they're, they're not cheap because it's, it's a precision manufactured, you know, component there. But, yeah, this was, they were $100 more than the Velocity Triggers one. And that's like, wow. But they did say that you can use it for three gun matches. So... Apparently, you can't use anyone else's trigger for three-gun matches. You have to use their, this new trigger for a three-gun match. So there's that. <laughs> hey, maybe we could, uh, ooh, we could put, uh, we got a velocity trigger. We could build a rifle. We could start, like, from the ground up and build a rifle. Yep. All right, my brain just is exploding. Pop, 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 pop. It's exploding right now as we speak. Check this out. I'm looking at this at the bottom line here. So we go to brownells.com. We get the components, we assemble them, we duracoat them, we frog lube the moving parts up, and we put a velocity trigger in it. There you go. <laughs> Mushroom and you can take cloud. Take fuel while you're doing it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we'll take some SWAT fuel right before we there start the assembly process. <laughs> Oh, kids, 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 kids. Here in 2015, we've got these really cool things uh, called computers. And uh, apparently, uh, there's a federal judge that just discovered the uh, the Google on the Internet machine. He just, uh, he's like in blades of glory. We have to congratulate him for discovering the, the Google, figuring out how to work the Google on the Internet machine. You say, what does this have to do with anything, and what is the Internet and Google and all that? What does that have to do with guns? Well, I'm going to tell you what. A uh, story here, the source is from Wired, and that is a, that's a, a geek magazine and a geek website for computer geeky type people. Uh, you guys know what Wired is, all you hip cats. Story uh, from 5615, 3D printed gun lawsuit starts the war between arms control and free speech. Now, am I going to do I believe that 3D printed guns, you know, made with polymer 3D polymer printers are probably the most expensive toy you're ever going to play with? Pr- pretty much, yeah. Uh, people are getting all in in a Twitter. They're they're just like pee in their pants. They're like, you don't understand. People will be able to like in back alleys and back rooms and and you know, like do you all of you, all the, all of your friends, let me guess, you at work have this one guy or this one woman who saw the 3D printed gun story 
and peed in their pants. And, and they said, look at this. People can build their own guns without the government knowing. <gasps> and what do they have to do? Well, all they have to do is have a 3D printer. Any 3D printer? No, I mean, it needs to be a really good one. So here's what, what I want to do. I want to build a 22, yes, a 22 long rifle gun without the government knowing. So I'm going to go out and Jared, what's a, what is a a good 3D printer cost? Uh, probably a few grand. I don't. I don't. Ten, not really. Go sure. ahead and look it up. All right, look up 3D printer right now and give me some ballpark prices. So while Jared's looking that up, and now the time and the material it costs to actually manufacture the components for the 3D gun, that's not free. You understand that? So. I mean, yes, it is a cool novelty, but is it is it at all practical? No, not at all. Uh, folks, people have been manufacturing guns, like in shops, in garages, in basements, uh, forever since they started making guns. It's, I mean, the the product itself is a couple hundred years old. It's not like. Uh, building a supercomputer, it's not really that difficult. You can get one on Amazon for $977. A 3D printer that you could actually print. Flashforge 3D printer, dual extruder, both ABS and PLA compatible, 8 by 8.8 by 5.7 by 5.9 inches. Oh, build volume, I mean. Mm, build volume. So yeah. you can't build anything larger than 8 by 5 inches. 8 by 5 by what? 8 by 5 by 5. By 8, five. 8 by 6 Nine by six by six. We'll just say that. Okay, nine by six by six. That's the biggest thing you can buy. And folks, here's the deal: if you wanted to to like make guns in in the jungles in India, we've reported on this previously, a long time ago. They're manufacturing guns in these these black market gun manufacturing things out in the in like garages and warehouses in the jungles in India. Without an internet connection, this one's uh, twenty nine hundred dollars. It says want it tomorrow. Uh, order within three hours and forty minutes. I can't imagine the shipping on that for one day shipping on the next computer. day shipping on a three D printer. Mm. Yeah, but when you have to have it, it's right? It's only thirty five pounds. Well, here's the deal. Why is this in the news? Well, the whole thing with three D printable guns is not so much about the actual component itself. It's about the program or the software the fact that you can that you can share or purchase or whatever via that this new thing called the internets uh, you can share the plans or the software to program your your 3d printer to make a gun to make the parts <gasps> oh no so you mean that the peasants could actually make a plastic 22 pistol without the government being aware of it? <gasps> we cannot allow that because millions upon millions of people will, will die in a hail of gunfire from plastic 3D printed guns that cost... You, know, you, you have a several thousand dollar investment in this really neat novelty called a 3D printed gun. Well, he said, well, all right, BFD, Paul, I don't care. Well, you should care because a sitting judge, a district judge, has ruled that the Second Amendment may technically, uh, I know all you hardcore constitutionalist people think that the Second Amendment, you know, guarantees your right to keep and bear arms, but it doesn't guarantee a right to manufacture them. Uh, did what? Oh, here we go. We we have uh, from from the judge's ruling. This is a district judge, a, a federal district court judge, and uh, we're, we go ahead. If you look at the show notes, or you want to go to the show notes at studentofthegunradio.com, click on the episode, check out the show notes. You can open it up, and you can read the entire legal finding. You can read the judge's finding, which is like 14 page, pages long. I, I don't know about you, but 
I would rather slam my hand in a door multiple times than read the finding from almost any court decision because it just drones on and on and on. But we've got to, we have a, a, an excerpt from the order right here. And like I said, you can read the whole thing. This is from the judge. It says, quote, while the founding fathers did not have access to such technology, and this comes from a lawsuit where uh, the 3D printed gun people were trying to uh, were trying to get an injunction. The government told them, them, no, you can't have this, you can't distrib- distribute it, and it's against the law. So they filed suit, and they're like, no, you can't stop us. The plaintiffs in this case maintain the ability to manufacture guns falls within the right to keep and bear arms protected by the Second Amendment. Plaintiffs suggest at the origins of the United States, blacksmithing and forging would have provided citizens with the ability to create their own firearms and thus bolster their ability to keep and bear arms. Well, yeah. Uh, While plaintiff's logic is appealing, plaintiffs do not cite any authority for this uh, proposition nor has the court located any so they can't prove that there were actually guys actual like citizens making guns in like shops you know uh, apparently I don't know the court further finds telling that this or finds telling that the Supreme Court's exhaustive historical analysis set forth in Heller the discussion of the meaning of keep and bear arms did not touch in any way uh, on an individual's right to manufacture or create those arms. The court is thus reluctant to find the ITAR regulations constitute a burden on the core of the Second Amendment. So here's the dealio, yo, yo, yo. Where did you see that? I didn't see that one. I was looking for that quote. Uh, it, it's in the it's in the second the second story, and it says from the order avail, under available in full right here. Oh, from the TTAG. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. So here's what the judge just ruled. The judge ruled that, sure, I guess you peasants are allowed to have guns. So you're allowed to own certain kinds of guns that the government has given you permission to own. But the Second Amendment does not protect you as an individual, as a citizen, in the manufacture or creating of those arms. So what they're saying is, you can have a gun all you want, but you need to get that gun from a manufacturer that has been given a license or a permission slip by the federal government. You get that? You got that? We're down with that? Okay, good. Now, ask me, would Paul, would you buy a gun from a guy who built it in his garage? Hell no, I wouldn't. I would not buy a gun from a guy who made it in his garage. I would like to buy a gun from a company that has spent thousands and even million dollars on research and development and testing and metallurgy and and all that jazz that that employs engineers. That's where I want to get my stuff from. It's like, would you buy a car from a dude that built it in his garage? A guy's like, I got a shop across the street and I built a car from scratch. Would you like to buy it from me? Uh, No, thanks. I would not like to buy it from you. Now, would it be an interesting novelty? Certainly it would be an interesting novelty. I would think it would be interesting. Uh, I wouldn't rely on it. Would you buy a car from a dude that made it in a warehouse out of parts that he found and and manufactured? Johnny Cash? Yeah, and and think that you were going to drive to work every day or be able to rely on that car? Mm, No. Would you print a 3D gun and say, that's going to be my home defense gun or my concealed carry? That's the gun I'm going to use to defend my life and the life of my family. Is that 3D printed gun? Probably not. But, but, are we on a slippery slope? We 100% are on a slippery slope. Because when these things, when these rulings come down, they set precedent and what you have is you have other courts will follow that. You got to watch this stuff. And it's not just about the Second Amendment, it's also about the First Amendment because what they're saying is that it's not that you can't make it. 
it's not that you can't manufacture it and transfer it from yourself to another person. That's not so much. It's that you can't possess the information or share the information to do this. Not actual guns, but the information on how to make the gun. Yep. So this is interesting to me. This is going, I'm going to move away from the Second Amendment and go back to the First Amendment uh, with this first story here. It says, under ITAR regulations, a piece of uncrackable crypto software like PGP, uh, I believe that stands for pretty good privacy. It's an email encryption. Don't Mm -hmm. quote me on that, though. Was considered a military munition. It says the PGP inventor Phil Zimmerman was even investigated by the Department of Justice for three years at the height of what has come to be known as the crypto wars. The Justice Department eventually dropped that investigation without an indictment or an explanation. But before it did, the cryptographer Dan Bernstein sued the State Department, arguing that ITAR was an unconstitutional violation of the First Amendment. He won. But... While government lawyers appealed the case, control of encryption software exports was moved from the State Department to the Commerce Department and then protected by a new exception, preventing Bernstein versus the United States from proving ITAR unconstitutional on the First Amendment grounds. Yes, it stands for pretty good privacy. And do do you understand what what that's all about, folks? So essentially, the government's like, we're not going to allow you peasants to have private conversations. Yeah. We're not going to allow the peasants to encrypt or send files from one to another that we can't read. Yep. Everything you say and do needs to be available to Big Brother. And if you try, if you smart they just guys... moved it. They're yeah. like, oh, by the way, oh, you're going to spend all this money suing us, but guess what? It doesn't matter. We're just going to shuffle the deck and... Uh, I didn't dig too deep that, into that this is, to figure out what exactly is absolute fact um but this i mean i would definitely not put this past our government oh no absolutely 100 so, percent based on their their current actions based on what when we did the whole thing yeah. about uh, uh uh edward snowden so that's what and the breakdown of the dick pics <laughs> i forgot about that oh yeah. yeah we did that for the grad program. yeah for the grad program yeah well, apparently the government was super, super bunged up over Snapchat. Now, I don't give a rat's ass about Snapchat, and I don't have Snapchat, but I know that it exists, right? Well, they were really bunged up, apparently, because the software that was created and used, they couldn't access, they couldn't crack it. They couldn't, they couldn't view people's messages, and it was really bunging them so up. So they couldn't, but other people could. Right, they couldn't, but other people could. Wow. They wanted, well, they, they wanted third-party access so that they could to see what you were, tra- and then it was really bunching them up that that somebody would dare to create software that kept the government from reading your messages. Wow! How dare they? You peasants don't need to have privacy. Just remember that, folks. I'm not even joking. I'm not even being glib. We are so far down the rabbit hole right now. We have people that occupy seats of power that legitimately believe. That it is their right, their purview, that they have the authority to monitor every single move you make from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep and even while you're sleeping. They firmly believe that you, just by living your life every day in privacy, are somehow a threat. Now, forget about the people that actually have come out, stood in front of cameras and say and said, "Hi, we're a threat to the United States. We're going to kill all of you infidels if we can." They're not so much worried about that. I mean, that's an ideology and you can't fight an ideology with bombs and bullets. You have to fight an ideology with better ideas. Huh? Paul, you just sounded like a retard when you said that. Yeah, I was quoting another retard uh, loosely when I just said that. So we have a government that's really, really bunged up about 3D printed guns. And we have a judge that is spending, you know, valuable time and oxygen debating whether or not the peasants should be allowed to make plastic guns for thousands and thousands of dollars. Dude, you want a gun that bad? Go to the store and spend, buy a high point. They're 199 bucks. Way cheaper, way more reliable than your plastic 3D printed gun. But you're like, but then someone will know I own it. Okay, whatever. 
But uh, we have uh, – there's a story out today about how t- uh, ISIS has been using Twitter as a recruiting tool and also a, a, a comm device where they're giving instructions to all these, quote, lone wolf people uh, worldwide – to commit atrocities, how they're commi- communicating back and forth with each other via Twitter. And we know this. The, the, the actual, the, the Twitter posts are public. And they're like, you know, the infidels will die, blah, 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 blah. Nobody's worried about that. They're not really concerned about that. Uh, this judge here in Texas, he's not concerned about the whole, you know, Tens of thousands of MS-13 gang members who are in America committing murders, rapes, atrocities. They're not concerned about that. What we really need to do is we need to crack down on these peasants and their plastic guns. That, in America, is the most important thing. Uh, you giving me the you giving me the finger? Yep. Uh, are we going to do the psycho thing? Uh, if you make it quick. Oh, really? I'm pretty sure that I can make this start as long as I want, but okay. Uh, you know what? It is. We're coming to the end of the show, so I'm going to go ahead and, and pull the psycho thing down, and maybe we'll talk about it during the grad program hour. Uh, because what we just spoke about was extremely important, and you hippies need to know about it. I know it's painful. I know you don't like to think about it because you realize that this is not the country that you knew when you were a child. It's not going to fix itself. What, is, what did Washington say? A quote from Washington. Uh, the, the only thing that evil needs to no, succeed is... No, it's, it's one that we can't say in the public hour. <laughs> the picture I sent you of Washington holding oh. an AK. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because uh, tyranny's not going to. Yeah. Right, exactly. All right, ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, uh, that's it for Student of the Gun Radio today. Now, tomorrow, uh, we've got two cities on the left coast. We've got L.A. and Seattle, who both said... Screw your Second Amendment. We do what we want. Be sure you're tuning in tomorrow. And be sure that you are a student for life.